Okay, so. Uh, yeah, so let's just review a teeny bit more of the, uh, this thing about algebraic cycles. So, uh, maybe, so I'm sorry, maybe this wasn't completely clear. So some aspects of some people ask a question. Uh, uh, so, l let me just clarify a little bit better, I hope. So here, y is a subvariety. I mean, this is essentially an injective map. I mean, if this is not an injective map, then the thing is going to be zero. Is it? So we can think of y as a smaller dimensional subvariety of x uh, included into x. The only thing is, I wrote, I wrote it this way just because the image. So we're really in the, the algebraic cycle is really the image of y inside x. So that's a sub. It's a subset of x. I mean, and it gives you a cycle inside x. So it's a two m dimensional homology class in x. The image could be a singular variety. Okay? If the image is a singular variety, instead of looking at the image variety itself, it's easier to, to resolve the singularity by your Hockey's theorem. So that's why I presented this as taking a map. Uh, so the, the, the algebraic cycle is really that depends on the image of y inside like x. Um, and so let me also say that uh, so the there's stuff called growth mean standard conjecture. So there's some sort of standard algebraic cycles. Uh, sorry, there are just some standard Hodge cycles. And we still don't know. We still don't know if they're algebraic cycles. So in other words, we just we even for, so, uh, I mean, part of the problem of the, of the Hodge conjecture is that it's not necessarily easy to write down a, a, even a Hodge cycle. It's not necessarily easy to say what the space of Hodge cycles of a given variety is and stuff like that. But nonetheless, the growth and the standard conjectures say that there's some homology, there's some cohomology classes which are automatically Hodge cycles just by general properties. And we still don't know that whether they're algebraic cycles. And the, and Th those versions of the Hodge conjecture are called the growth and standard conjecture. So examples are like Kunin projectors. And this operator lambda that we saw before. A couple of shows. It's some kind of, roughly speaking, some sort of inverse of wedging with the with the hydroplane section class. So maybe a sort of an interesting side remark is that Yvon Bay has an interesting theory. <coughs> what he calls motivated cycles. Which, what does it mean? It basically says take algebraic cycles and add lambda. So lambda is a, 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 if you write it down in the right way, lambda is a, is a Hodge cycle. I mean, you know, lambda is a morphism, but uh, I mean, I wanted to say this also. Uh, if you have a map of Hodge structures from H, K of X into H, L of Y, Then it corresponds to a Hodge class in H. Well, let's say that's already in this calculation. Something other. Sasha will tell me. No. It, it, it corresponds to a, a morphism of Hodge structures. Corresponds to a Hodge class inside H, uh, some number that we should calculate here uh, of x cross y. Okay, and this is viewed as a correspondence. <laughs> You mean just uh, to n minus, minus k plus l, where n is dimension of x? Maybe. Something like that. Uh, anyway, is that some number which, uh, with, with the property that it, it gives you a, a correspondence that induces this map?
And the condition of being amorphous in the Hawk structures, namely that this sends the PQ spaces into the PQ spaces with maybe some shift and so on. Uh, that, uh, that's corresponding to the saying that it's a Hodge class. And the Hodge conjecture says that says that all these things are algebraic cycles, so we get so we get correspondences in category of varieties. <laughs> So if, if we knew this truth, if we knew this, then we would get there would be a, a really good theory of motives. Okay. Because there would be kind of a one to one, I mean, not really one to one mess, but there would be a good correspondence between. Uh, Natural operations on cohomology and uh, correspondence is given by, by sub varieties of x cross y. The q vector space generated by sub varieties of x cross y. Uh, so, well, we, so we don't know it. That's this whole, the whole industry of trying to make a theory of motives is designed to sort of get around the problem that we don't know the Hodge conjecture. And so, what can we say about what, how, kind, what kind of theory of motives? So, what kind of theory of Sort of this type of natural correspondence can we create uh, even without knowing the Hawking connection? Of course, that's very complicated. Uh, but anyway, so the, you know, the lambda is a map from HK of X into HK minus 2 of X. And so it, that's what, in this sense here, that I mean that lambda would be a Hodge, should be a Hodge cycle. Uh, so Yvonne Lane has a theory where he says, okay, let's just. Say okay, we're too bad. We don't know that lambda is an algebraic cycle, but it's supposed to be an algebraic cycle. So why don't we just add it into our collection of, of sort of good cycles, you might say? So we say algebraic cycles plus anything that has to do with lambda, and then actually that generates a very nice theory. In fact, that has a lot of interesting good properties. Uh, you can read about this in his paper on IGS paper. I think in, re in recent times maybe it's just coming a little bit more into 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 fashion. For a long time, this, this was an, a really old paper. For a long time, nobody really talked too much about that, I think. Mean, uh, I think that was not necessarily uh, reasonable. Anyway. So I think it's possible that we, there might be sort of an intermediate way of getting some kind of theory of motives where you sort of use Yvonne Lay's uh, and you sort of just add uh, lambda. And so for example, I think, uh, one thing, for example, I think if you add lambda, then you get the Kudos projectors also. Okay, anyway, so that's, that's kind of the whole theory of algebraic cycle. Um, okay, so uh, now the next thing I want to talk about is polarization. So this is an important property of Hodge structures that come from varieties. So Hodge structures that come from varieties This is, this is, so this is an important phenomenon. So the so where, where does this come from? This comes from what's called the hodge riemann bilinear relations. sign changes that happen. One of them is crucial and the other is maybe not all that crucial. 
opinion. So, uh, so the first step is to talk about that primitive. Homology class. So in this case, so when we have a, a projective variety, so if x is a projective, and then suppose the Kähler metric is the Fubini shooting metric from a projective embedding of x or something maybe similar to that. So in any case, the cohomology class of omega is in H2 of x comma q. Because it's it's C one of one although there's some maybe two pi's in there but uh, up to some factors of square to minus one should probably be good plus or minus wasn't so great the two pi's are definitely not good um, but up to some <laughs> constants like that uh, this is basically the first term class of the of the ample lemma that's giving the projective embedding of x uh, so it's a Rational. And so now wedging with omega, or it could be, and so, so what sometimes we call this H also. So this is also the, this is the cohomology class, of, so as we were saying before, the, the Poincare dual of the homology. The cohomology class corresponding to the homology class of a hyperpoint section. So a hyperpoint section, if x has dimension n, then the h has dimension n minus one. So it's an n, so it's a two n minus two dimensional homology class, but it's a two dimensional cohomology class. So it's an h two x. So wedge omega is a is a map a clock structure from h k of x into h k plus two of x. And then this, then this lambda, the adjoint, is a map from h k of x into h k minus two of x. And it's sort of a basic proposition is that these come from a representation of Lie algebra. Uh, SL2 on H star of X. Where the central element acts by, uh, I guess, probably up to a sign, uh, plus or minus, let's say, uh, K minus N. Central element, uh, sorry, what, whatever the central, the, 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 uh, the forest. The diagonal element of SL2 acts by plus or minus k minus n on HK. Okay. So as a result of this, plus the structure theory for representations of SL2, we have the following structure theory for the cohomology. So, the primitive, well, maybe it's easy to just draw this, okay? So what is the structure theory of representations of SL2? It says that a representation of SL2 uh, is organized into a direct sum of irreducible representations. And the irreducible representations look something like this. So here the arrows are. The arrows are the action of omega. Okay. And this, the vertical things are the, the degree, the cohomological degree. So, and the middle, the middle piece is n minus k equals zero, so it's k equals n. So this is the middle. Cohomology dimension of x. So in more specific, more precise terms, uh, if we define the primitive cohomology class, P, K of X, 
to be. So what is the primitive cohomology class? So, so there's an action of SL2 on the cohomology. So the, this coordinate is the cohomological degree. And this is wedging with omega. So it increases the cohomological degree by 2. And the, the irreducible pieces are these chains where you go from there up to there. They're sort of symmetrically organized around the middle. Okay. So the primitive of this stuff is we would just like to look at all of this stuff. Okay. So the primitive stuff is only going to be up to dimension k, uh, up to dimension n. And it's all sort of the starts of the chain. So how do we isolate what's the starting point of a chain? Well, in degree k, if we apply n minus k times omega, that goes over to the end of the chain. And if we do it once more, it's 0. So this is the current. So a primitive, a primitive class is one where when you apply omega the, the good number of times, and then one more, you get 0. So this is the kernel of uh, wedge omega, so this is probably n minus k plus 1, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, mapping from h k of x into h uh, k plus 2 times n minus k. That's going to be 2n minus k plus 2. Again. So, uh, but, I mean, you should refer to the pictures, I would say, instead of my indices. So, so, this is called the primitive cohomology. And since it's the kernel of a map which is really, uh, which is respects the Hodge structure, right? Omega, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, I should, should have said this, a uh, crucial point here, which is that omega is actually, I said it's in H2, but in, in fact, the class of omega is in H11. So in particular, omega is a, you know, a typical example of a Hodge class. Uh, that's, that's the thing which is provided to us by the left shift 1, 1 theorem. So the primitive cohomology is a sub hot structure. And then the theorem is the following. The theorem is that the intersection pair gives a polarization of this sub hot structure. You might say that the reason why we need to introduce this is because the, what the theorem really says is that minus 1 to the k times the intersection form gives a polarization. And then there's another plus or minus 1 and probably some other constants and stuff. But, um, but so the, the, this polarization form, the sign of this, the intersection, the sign of the intersection form depends on the k of the primitive thing. And in particular, you can't do, it's, this is not going to be true if we just take hk. This is, I mean, it's not really, it's not a fundamentally difficult detail here. This is not one of the main, as far as I know. <coughs> Maybe all history might prove me wrong, but um, as far as I know, this is not really a fundamental thing, but it's kind of a, an annoying detail in the, in the whole way. Um, sorry? Geometrically important. The question is the. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I, as I said, history will undoubtedly prove me wrong. But I mean, in terms of the development of the, the, just the theoretical development, it's. Comes at, at, at the start in any case, comes as a sort of annoying detail. Um, I'll explain in a minute why it's actually kind of a little bit natural in some ways. Anyway, but, uh, okay, so, uh, but so, so, so the, but the point here is why am I doing this primitive stuff um, just on a technical level? Because it wouldn't be true, this theorem wouldn't be true if I just took the full cohomology, okay? Uh, because there's a, it, there, the sign changes on the different pieces. Anyway, uh, but so on the, on the primitive cohomology class, 
What does it say? It says that so if we take the form, which is so we define alpha inner product with beta to be the integral over x of alpha wedge beta wedge omega to the uh, 2k to the n minus k. So this is a real, so this is a, in fact, this is a Q. I mean, this is a, uh, and, uh, I guess, so it's a bilinear form. With Q coefficients on our hot structure V, Q, which is H, which is P. It has Q coefficients because, remember, we're assuming here that we're on an algebraic, we're on a projected variety, so the hyperplane class has Q coefficients. And so it, it's symmetric or anti-symmetric depending on the parity of K. Right, because alpha wedge beta, if they're if they're even degree forms, then it's symmetric, and if they're odd degree forms, it's anti-symmetric. Now it has a certain positivity property, so it has the sort of Hodge theoretic pop positivity property. <laughs> and so we should do this in a sort of Hermitian sense. So it says that if we take alpha comma beta, I mean let's say alpha comma alpha bar, so this is going to be, let's say positive. So there's some constant here. Try to note down. Then there's going to be a minus one, which is let's say p. This constant could even have some square root of minus one. I'm sorry, but I don't know what the constant is. But we look at the references. Um, but, but the main point here is that there's a sign change. So this is positive definite for alpha in the PQ part of the primitive. Okay. So, so the, the, the main point here is that as we change, so uh, right, P, the PK is the direct sum of P, PQ. This is the same as the HK and the HPQ, except that we just take this kernel of omega. So as we change the, the, the right, so, so typically like P2 might be P1, P2, 0, plus P1, 1, plus P0, 2, okay, for example. Okay, so there's a whole string of Hodge subspaces. And the point is that the sign of this form, so you turn this, take this real value form and turn it into a Hermitian form. We need to make it into a Hermitian form because these are complex subspaces, right? Uh, if you think a little bit about the, the disease and the disease of bars, if we tried to take alpha, which alpha, then that probably wouldn't have the right number of disease and disease bars. Okay. If we take alpha, which alpha bar, then alpha has PQ, and alpha bar has QP. So we get P plus Q comma P plus Q, and then the omega n minus k, that adds exactly the good number. Because if we want to integrate something over x, remember, if we integrate over x, it should be a top degree form. Remember that a top degree form has to have exactly the same number of dz's as dz bars. Right? Because uh, there's just no other possibility. You know, if, n, if x has dimension n, there's going to be n complex coordinates. So there's dz1 up to dzn, so z1 up to zn. So the, the only possibility for a top degree form is dz1 bar up to dzn bar. Sorry, dz1 up to dzn times dz1 bar up to dzn bar. So it has to be n dz and n dz bars. When you integrate something like a top degree form of Rex, the total number of the total Hodge type has to be n n. Otherwise, it's zero. And because of that, you can just see that you should do alpha alpha bar. Okay. But the point here is that the the sign changes as we go from one place to the next. 
That's why I'm saying the Hodge theoretic positivity. That's this minus one. And there's a global constant. And so this, and this global constant here, uh, that's doing this. This global constant is changing sign as we change the, the k of the primitive. Anyway, but so uh, put all together, that's the notion of polarized hot structure. So a polarized hot structure is a hot structure that has a form uh, with this property. symmetric or anti-symmetric depending on the parity of k, and it has this positivity property on the hot substance. Well, so uh, an important example, which, I mean, which doesn't really happen very often, but it's important to keep in mind, is the case of a unitary. So it's uh, a unitary example. Erased, right? The, the, all the subs, any subspace is, is a direct sum of the primitive subspace wedged with the appropriate power of omega. Okay. And so and this gives a polarization of H. The hot structure. So the hot structure on the cohomology of X, the one we did at the start, is actually polarized. It's just that the polarization, to get the polarization, you shouldn't exactly use the intersection form. You should use the intersection form, but where you change the sign depending on uh, the, the power of L that you need to get back to a primitive form, basically. So that's just a small detail. But that's this whole primitive thing. So that, that's how, uh, and so, uh, sorry, 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 I should, this is all a theorem, of course. Uh, this is called the Hodge-Riemann bilinear relation. So actually, it's not such a bad exercise to do it, for example, for surfaces. Um, so for surfaces, the, there's, in H2 of a surface, there's two pieces. There's the, there's the omega. 
in, in H2, which is in H1 and 1. Then there's the rest of the hot structure. The rest of the hot structure is primitive. Okay. There's nothing, nothing, nothing too much going on, but, the, but there's still, there's the, the omega and then there's the primitive stuff. Okay. And, so, and the, the intersection form has a different sign on the omega and on the primitive, but also it has a different sign on the 1, 1 or the 2, 0 or the 0, 2. So if you put those two together, you see that, in fact, the sign of the intersection form on the 2, 0, the 0, 2, and the omega part is the same. And the sign of the form on the 1, 1 part that's orthogonal to omega is the opposite. Okay. Uh, and that, that actually, that, that kind of fact entered into Donaldson theory, which maybe we'll, I'm not sure if we'll see that tomorrow, but uh, that entered into Donaldson theory. I mean, this thing of self-dual versus anti-self-dual, that's exactly this difference of sign, basically. So you might say the self, I'm not sure which one is self or anti-self, but uh, I guess you should know. Uh, anyway. uh, one, of, one, one of those two groups, either the omega plus the 2, 0 plus the 0, 2, that's one of the self-dual. And the other one is the anti, you know, one, one that are not. Uh, okay. So I, th I guess that, I mean, we tried to do that. Well, Okay, so, uh, so the conclusion here is that, the, that if we have a variation of hot structure that comes from a family of varieties, so uh, that's why I wanted to make the comment at the start about the map. The map we were using for an algebraic cycle that was an injective or you know generically injective map. Whereas this is a surjective map, right? Well, it's not quite. Uh, so, if we, so going back to what we said this morning, if you take a smooth proper map of, of algebraic projective varieties, in this case, then if we define the VQ. Define our variation of hot structure in this way. Then it's polarized. It has a polarization. Which is to say a, a form. Satisfying those properties. And this form is locally constant. I mean, it sort of has to be again. I mean, if you think of it as varying continuously, it's a it's a rational valued form. So it's not going to vary if it's continuous. So it's locally constant. And in particular, the monodromy, the action of the monodromy transformation, so the monodromy representation, so remember we have the monodromy representation rho from pi 1 of s comma s0 into gl of v s0. This actually maps into this factors through a group which we'll call a G Q. So G Q is the automorphism of the vector space with its form. So this is either, so this is going to be, uh, let's say, O
So remember, so this is a form which is an indefinite form. So in the case of k even, it's an indefinite form. It's going to have some signature r comma s. Uh, in the case of uh, odd degree, it's an anti-symmetric form. So it's going to so the group is the symplectic. Group. So the the all the stuff, you know, all, all the theorems about variation of Hopf structure, they all use the polarization property. So uh, pretty much. Let me just mention some, uh, we probably won't have really enough time to get to these too much, but um, so a typical setup, uh, well, so yeah, so the first one is the invariant cycle. So it says that if we have a point, uh, so if uh, V is an H0 of S, with coefficients in this VQ. So it's a locally constant section, globally defined. says it's a Hodge cycle of all the other points. So the Hodge conjecture would say it has to also be an algebraic cycle at all the other points. That we don't know how to prove that. Okay? And in some sense, it's, it's kind of just a deformational question. So, but the problem is it's a deformational question, but for something where the, an algebraic cycle, it could be a sum of you know, positive and negative coefficients times uh, subvariety. But some, by roughly speaking, it means that your subvariety at one point, you should be able to deform it to a subvariety at all the other points. Okay? And we don't know how to do that. There's an obstruction called the semi-regularity map, for example. Not the semi, right? There's some difference of variety which moves. The yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's, that's so, the problem. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> being an algebraic cycle means it's a Q coefficient sum of, of yeah. subvarieties. But we don't know what type of subvariety we should do a plus and minus, basically. Um, that's, that's, kind of, that's one of the big problems. So but what Yvonne Gray's theory says, it tells you that, in fact, if you know it's a motivated cycle, so if you know, for example, it's an algebraic cycle at one point, you can actually prove that it's a motivated cycle in the sense of Yvonne Clay at all the other points. Uh, that's one nice property. Uh, so now let me say here, so this, so it's not, you can do, you can do this yourself, actually, uh, in the case where S is compact. But now in the case where S is non-compact, that's where a whole 
another subject of Hodge theory comes in. Uh, in the case of where the base is not compact. And that's actually quite typical. So in all the examples I said so far, for example, uh, typically S is not compact. So in other words, S will be a, a quasi-protected prime. Now, there's several different things that are going on in this case. Um, one of them is that if you have a singular variety, then the cohomology of a singular variety has what's called a mixed Hutch structure. It's a vector space, so let's call it V. Yes, bar. Has something called the weight filtration. Let's call it W. And the GER. Filtration it has a different filtration, and the, the quotients of the filtration are pure hot structures of weight L, but so they're, so they're sort of pure hot structures at different weights. So, in particular, you have so a single cohomology class, you have Hodge numbers. Quasi-projected varieties and there you go, three was for singular varieties. So kind of like in a really brief nutshell, uh, if you take your singular variety and resolve singularities, then you can turn it into a simplicial, you make a sort of simplicial uh, smooth variety. And from that simplicial variety, you sort of make a double complex and take the cohomology of each level. When you combine the different levels together, uh, you get this thing where you the, the, the same one single cohomology group. Single HK still has different different pure Hodge structures at different different weights. 
That's one thing that's going on. So that's kind of going on at the boundary. The, now the other thing that's going on here is what, what's called the theory of degenerating variation of bump structure. So it's called, the, the, so the main theorems are called the no potent orbit theorem and the SL2. Yeah, but okay. So if we have a given singular variety, then that's uh, then then the the mixed hop structure is unique. So it, it doesn't depend on the resolution of singularity. That's part of Deligne's theory. But as you say, if we uh, this, this compactification here is not unique. So the the singular varieties that can occur on the boundary, those are not necessarily unique. Um, and the mixed hop structure, well, uh, I'm not sure whether I'm not even sure whether the pure pieces are. I mean, they're probably more more uniquely determined than the than the non-pure ones. I mean, it's not sure maybe knows or something, but but I mean in general, I mean generally if you compactify this in different ways, there's not necessarily a canonical way of getting the singular thing. So but I mean that's kind of what's happening in for, I mean that's this is happening, you know, this is the current subject in minimal model theory for the moduli of varieties of general type, um, which is how to kind of choose a good compactification in such a way that the singularities are here are some have some kind of canonical structure. Like com monolog terminal type thing or something like that. In that case, you might hope that the, the, the piece, the mixed heart, either the mixed heart structures or, as you say, at least the pure quotients are more unique. Um, yeah, yeah, that's it, but it's not quite the same one, in fact. But <laughs> then, and so, so that's what I'm about to get to here. There's something called the no potent orbit theorem and the SL2 orbit theorem, which govern the structure. Govern the asymptotic structure <clears throat> which um, to, to put it in a word, it govern the asymptotic information of our variation of hot structure here. So we're gonna have our variation of hot structure here, and then but it's this is some kind of uh, some kind of data coming from elliptic equations and so on, which is going to have some kind of asymptotic behavior as we go towards the point here. And there's some kind of um, part of the structure here is that there's there's a mixed hot structure that shows up here. I'm not I'm not I'm I mean, this is very this is complicated. We don't have probably enough time to discuss more detail about this. Not really good. Um, you know, you can look this up on the web. I don't know how this, that will be, but... Uh, so, uh, this is... This, these theories are by Griffiths and Schmidt. And then also in higher dimensions, Katani, Kaplan, and Schmidt. There's going to be uh, so MHS means mixed hot structure. There's a mixed hot structure uh, governing uh, this uh, this asymptotic information. Speaking, there's something called the Clement Schmidt exact sequence. That relates the 
it relates this week's talk structure with this one. I mean, uh, very, very roughly speaking, um, this mixed talk structure is going to have this. The mixed talk structure of the singular variety is going to sort of have a Hodge diamond that looks something like this, maybe, maybe the opposite direction. And this one is going to sort of go in both directions. The mixed talk structure that, that um, that's governing this de degeneration has a Hodge diamond that uh, that's kind of symmetrical. The I mean, it's, it's kind of it's. There's an analog with what I was saying about the the primitive stuff and stuff like that, which is that there's the monodromy operator, uh, which serves it's like this else L two representation stuff. There's this the monodromy operator sort of goes between uh, I mean plays a similar role to the omega that we saw before. Um, you know, I'm just kind of saying stuff here, but. Uh, but anyway, the, the, there's a mixed talk structure that's governing this thing, which is in some sense sort of a combination of two copies of this mixed talk structure, uh, the mixed talk structure of just the singular variety. So it's sort of true that the mixed talk structure of the singular variety tells you about the degeneration, but, it, but it's a, a little bit more complicated. There's a, it's kind of doubled up in some way. And how that doubled up thing works is governed by the Clement instrument exact sequence. So yeah, there's not enough time to this whole thing would take a good semester course. Okay, so so what I wanted to say just to end maybe today. Um, so we'll, so we'll be discussing a little bit more about this. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. I need to say one more thing, which is that um, it's this this theory here. This allows you, for example, to prove the. I mean, I'll say this. I was saying the local invariant cycle theorem when S was compact. If S is not compact, then you need the full power of this asymptotic information in order to prove this local invariant cycle theorem that I said before about the, the Hodge types thing staying the same in a, for a flat section. And there's maybe another thing which you can prove, uh, maybe I'll not write it on the board, but there's something, there's, there's a theorem of Deline, Kantani, Kaplan, which tells you that the locus of points where you have a Hodge class is actually an algebraic subvariety. So that's something which, that's a consequence that would be a consequence of the Hodge conjecture. That the locus of points where you have an extra, you might say, Hodge class in the cohomology, it's called the node there left, left shift locus. Um, if, if, the, if the Hodge conjecture were true, that would automatically be an algebraic subvariety of the base, or let's say some countable union of algebraic subvarieties of the base, and deleting Katani Kaplan. They prove, they prove that consequence of the Hodge conjecture. They, they prove the, the no of left shuts. Okay, so uh, let me just finish. So I'd just like to mention something called the intermediate Jacobian. Because that's also something which, uh, if you're looking at modern, uh, modern work you know, in mirror symmetry and rationality questions and stuff like that that comes up quite often. So let's look at the Hodge diamond. So the intermediate Jacobian uh, comes when you look at odd dimensional cohomology classes. Let's do an example. Uh, this is the this is the classical example of Clemens and Griffiths. I looked this up on Wikipedia. I hope I got my numbers correctly. So let's look at a cubic threefold uh, x inside P four. Okay. So this just means a hypersurface defined by a cubic equation by a single cubic equation. Okay. The Hodge diamond.
I'm not sure about this one. Is that a one? Or is it? Is, it, is this a one? Exception. Yeah. For, uh, this is supposed to be five, I think, but is this a one? Anyway. I don't know. Uh, I'm not hundred percent sure about whether this is I, I guess this is probably a one. Right. So it's a base value of one. Sorry? Thirty four thirty dimensional cubic. So if you explore the current one values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is that is that correct or not? Yeah, the current one. Okay, 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 okay. Anyway, but what but what one look at here is this thing, okay? So this is the this is the Hox Rockstron H3 index. Okay? So usually on the Hox Rockstron H3 of X, we usually have four different subspaces. So if you look at the Hodge diamond, if you take an odd dimensional cohomology class, then it's split into two halves, okay? And these halves are, are symmetric, right, by the by the complex conjugation. So I mean even here, these two are pretty symmetric. So this number has to equal this number, and this number has to equal this number. So it tells you that you can take a subspace, the Hodge filtration, So let's just say, you know, so, okay, if we take H3 or H2K1, any odd number, the Hodge filtration, uh, the, the good level of Hodge filtration is going to be a subspace F, uh, so I guess it'll be F poly 2 or something like that. So, if we take the Hodge filtration subspace and take its, its complex conjugate, then those divide the space into two pieces, okay? And so we have H3 is equal to F2 plus F2 bar. And then we also have inside this H3 of X comma Z. And then the intermediate Jacobian is the complex torus. Which is just, let's say, like one of these two. <laughs> so, so, so this is going to be like, so in our example here, this is going to be a 10 dimensional uh, free abelian group. This is going to be a 5 dimensional. So this is going to be a, a c to the 5 divided by a z to the 10. Okay. You guys see how that works? Sasha sees how that works, but does everybody else see how that works? The, if you take half of the stuff, this half is going to be half the complex dimension, right? But the complex dimension of this is equal to the real dimension of the real cohomology class, or it's the rank of the rational cohomology, or the integer cohomology. So if, if we if we just take the full cohomology, we'll get like c to the n divided by z to the n. I mean that's not really uh, all that interesting as a complex source. But if we can take half of it, then that's going to be c to the something or other modulo z to the two times that. Okay. And this is a complex source. <coughs> and so what, what's going on here is that. Uh, the fact that we have a zero, so so uh, um, so in general, so we can always do this in general. So whenever we have an odd dimensional Hodge structure, we can always sort of take half of the, you take the middle part of the Hodge filtration, we can make half of that and, and do this. So we can take H3 mod half the Hodge filtration and then divide by the Z, because it's like, let's say it has a Z structure. And, and we'll get a complex torus. So generally speaking, uh, the complex torus is not intermediate Jacobian is not an algebraic abelian variety because it's polarized by a, a let's say a Q cohomology class but it's not definite so in, uh, I guess if you look at the theory of theta functions you need some kind of a, a positive definiteness in order to define the theta functions and have the series converge and everything. Uh, that's because of this G 
change of sign. So that's, that's, that, would, that would be the case if this was non-zero. So if this term was non-zero, then, then our polarization form is going to have two different signs, the sign of this piece and the sign of this piece, because of that minus 1 to the p. Okay? But in this case, so you can see if, if there's only one non-zero Hodge number, then the, now the polarization does have a sign, because in this case, this is zero. So the, the, the piece that has a, an opposite sign is not there. So in this case, so, uh, so in our case, H30 equals zero, so the polarization That form has a definite sign. So I'm kind of doing, I'm sort of treating two, two things at once here. So if you did this to the degree one piece, then of course that would always be true. But that's how you get an abelian variety, which is the Albanese variety or the Jacobian variety of, the, of X. If we do this to a degree one piece, then we have our polarization form always has a definite sign. That makes this into an algebraic abelian variety. Okay. So we get an abelian variety. So we get a projective. So in, this, in the Clemens Griffiths example, you still get an abelian variety because we have a zero here. Right? So in any, in any kind of threefold, if you have H30 is zero, then the intermediate Jacobian is going to be an abelian variety. And Clemens Griffiths used this abelian variety to prove non rationality. surface, and this was, uh, I'm not sure who the first person was, but this was discussed by Brendan Nassa. And here's where this business about the primitive stuff actually becomes a little bit important. Because you can't really say, okay, we can say, okay, well actually this has a class in it, which is the omega here. Right, the omega squared, I mean this is omega and this is omega squared. Um, so we could just divide by omega and then we would have 20, 1, 20, 20 and so on. That would be a K3 surface. But the sign of the polarization would be wrong. Because if we just divide by the omega, then inside here we would have the same 120 uh, with a 20 in the middle. But we wouldn't have a piece, we would no longer have a piece that has the sign, which is the opposite sign from the, polar, from the primitive form. So because in the, in the K3 surface, the omega piece here, the polarization form has the opposite sign. So in some sense, this look, would look a lot like a K3 surface, but not really a K3 surface. And if, if I'm understanding correctly, I just quickly look at, look at that. If I understand correctly, Hassett's point of view here is that suppose we have another algebraic cycle. So we have two algebraic cycles, omega plus another one. Then if we divide by both of those, then that can look like a K3 surface divided by omega, basically. Uh, something like that. Anyway, but so that's this, that, um, this idea of sort of finding sub-Hodge diamonds which look like, which look like smaller dimensional varieties, I think that's sort of a, uh, a currently modern uh, viewpoint. Uh, anyway, okay, so I'll stop here.